morning, everyone. Um, good morning, atheists, agnostics, skeptics, freethinkers, whatever you like to call yourself, you are welcome here. At TL Atheist Church, we call ourselves an atheist church because you will never hear anything supernatural talked about from the podium. So today's talk, which is um, mostly based on the book Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow uh, by Daniel Kahneman, um, is sort of a continuation from what we were talking about last week. So last week, the, the ideas really come from Daniel Kahneman, but last week we were talking about a book by Richard O'Connor called Rewire, where um, Richard O'Connor was talking about uh, how we might um, influence our system one thinking. So in case anybody missed any of this, I'll just do a bit of a, of a walk back. Uh, system one includes all of your unconscious thinking. And it's the unconscious stuff that your body does or the stuff your body does unconsciously, like beat your heart, cause you to breathe, but also a lot of your thinking that, that happens that's based on your biases and your paradigms. So 99% of our thinking goes on there. And system two is what we do when something uh, kind of calls us to our attention that this is a novel situation, we really need to think about it. And so then we get triggered to do a um, conscious assessment of things. So this book is divided into five sections. And the first section just kind of goes over the, the difference between system one and system two. But sections two through four goes over the shortcuts that our system one takes when we're thinking. And system one, if you're like me, you probably think, think mostly that your thinking is conscious and that your system one just takes care of those like automatic nervous system type things. But actually most of your thinking is also done by that automatic part of your brain. And I want to go deeper into sort of how powerful your system one thinking is. So system one is able to intuit that a triad of words has something in common, even before it can determine what it is that it has in common. And it can tell that words are linked within two seconds, faster than I can say the words to let you experiment with it in here. So triads of words like light, dive, and rocket what they have in common is sky, and cottage, Swiss, and cake, which those words have in common is cheese. Uh, the, the automatic system can just push the button that says, yeah, these words are linked, and knows which words are not linked. <clears throat> they also have found, incidentally, that when you are happy, you can do it faster and more reliably than if you are unhappy. So system one has to have a lot of background information that it's pulling together, piecing together to make these kinds of decisions. And what, another uh, technique that the system one does is that if you ask it a question that it doesn't know the answer to, it will ask a very similar question that it does know the answer to and pull that um, information forward, right? So let's say, for example, that I tell you I've spent the day in New York City going to favorite tourist spots and I was just getting on the bus uh, when I realized that my wallet was missing. So a lot of people in that situation fill in as a possible uh, what happened was that the person was pickpocketed. But if I tell you I spent the day studying with my classmates and I was just getting on the bus when I noticed that my wallet was not in my purse, People will often fill in part of the story that possibly somebody left their uh, wallet at the coffee shop or at the library. Okay, so your life experiences lead you to fill in the blanks of stories. And if uh, a research subject is shown, um, just shown something that says, and approach the bank, Depending on if they've been thinking about rivers recently, or they've been thinking about financial institutions recently, they're going to very quickly make some assumptions about what kind of bank it is. If you have been primed to be thinking about washing dishes and then you're shown the letters S-O space 
pee, we will fill it in a soap. If they're primed to be thinking about dinner or simple foods, and then they're shown SO space P, they fill it in as soup. So the, the idea here is just that all your background information and that your priming affects what you see to a much higher degree than people realize. And so we can be primed to respond in a certain way by cues in the environment. Now, often our system two thinking will come up with explanations that sound extremely rational, but they don't necessarily reflect how system one thinking really works. An example of this is David Hume um, thought that we inferred causality by watching one thing interact with another. Um, so we believe that a cue sets the pool ball in motion. But actually, uh, Michaud, Heider, and Simo found that what we do is that we see causality in the same way that we see color. We see something and we make up a story about it, okay? So one of the things that they did was they created these films where one little shape chases another shape. And but in the same way that you fill in the whole story about the pickpocket or you fill in the whole story about soap and soup, they would fill in a whole story about these shapes. One shape is a bully, the other shape is running to get away. And they, they perceive both uh, intention and emotion, okay, and causality. And that infants as young as one years old also are able to identify bullies and to behave in a way that is they look surprised when the various characters, and by characters I mean shapes, respond in unexpected ways, okay? So we're beginning to understand what, how much of this is just kind of like innate. Um, in, in 2005, um, a claim was made that we separate out the intention to do something from the physical causality of it. So you make a decision to do something, but we don't notice that we decide as part of the chain of causality. And so we, this is his excuse. I'm sorry that I didn't write down this guy's name because it seems to be kind of an alternate theory to Darwin's, um, Dawkins theory about the idea of the big mind out there because this is the same idea where he says, we perceive a world of minds which are separate from the worlds of bodies. And this is what allows us to separate our physical and spiritual dimensions, okay? So we don't see ourselves as part of a chain of our, our mind having a thought as part of the chain of activity that causes us to do something physical in the world. Now, uh, so I'm sort of going through a lot of these little studies to just kind of give you it's a, a, a taste. Literally, there's like two studies per page on this entire book of crazy amount of things that researchers are doing to try to get an idea of how the system one thinking is working. But suffice it to say, it is not working the way in your kind of layman's idea of how your mind works. All this thinking is taking place that you're not even aware of. A psychologist named uh, Zajonek wanted to study the effects of stimulus. So he placed ads in uh, the paper of random Turkish sounding words. These were words like sardia and sarakik. And later, then he asked people in the communities to say if these words meant something good or bad. The words actually had no meaning and the people had no idea what the, the similar word in Turkish meant. But people who'd been exposed to a word frequently were um, inclined to say that the word meant something good. So just becoming comfortable and familiar with the word made you think that it was something good. And in a similar study, people, who, uh, people believe that companies with pronounceable, friendly names would outperform companies with different, uh, difficult to pronounce names. So Emmett, and Swiss First were expected to do very well, but Terig Brej and Epoxymeth were expected to do poorly, just based on nothing more than 
the pronunciability of their names. So the next piece that I want to share with you is that system one is doing this thinking, but system two isn't even aware that system one is doing the thinking. So it's not like system two can now like check the thinking of system one because all the system one is happening without you even realizing it. You're jumping to conclusions and then the, the conclusion is being presented sort of fait accompli um, without any opportunity to kind of revise it and think about it. We are meaning making machines and the meanings that we make up are not necessarily accurate. White fish eat candy. You just constructed that thought in your mind of white fish eating candy. So there's evidence that the way the brain works is that it first attempts to believe something with system one. And then if you're lucky, system two comes along, questions it, and then tries to unbelieve it. But your default is to be gullible. After you've already believed it for a split second, white fish eat candy. Your brain can construct what that might mean. And so now you actually have to, you have to step back and question it. Um, there was a study where people had to read basically nonsensical statements. And then it was followed by true or false. And, but in this case, they were given a mental task to hold a string of numbers in their brain at the same time that they were doing that. And they did terribly at later being able to remember if true or false was associated with a statement. Because the system two, by the fact that you, system two was kept busy holding those numbers in place. So system two couldn't really filter on or make any comment on or thoughts about things like white fish eat candy. So if you say white fish eat candy, true, like you just want to say it's all true because kind of, because I read it and I accepted it, but I didn't have a chance to reject it at all. Um, you really need to focus on one thing at a time to give your system two a chance to work. When system two is busy trying to multitask, you are more likely to be gullible, okay? Now, a long time ago, Stephen and I went to Bali and we were invited for a pitch for a timeshare. One of the most frightening experiences of our lives, which um, mostly because they, they took us really far off into the mountains to this remote place where they were doing the pitch. And, but what happens is that they don't want you to have your system to to even have a moment to, to think about anything, right? Like if you had a timeshare in Bali, you'd be here all the time having fun. Wouldn't that be fun? Yes. Thank you, system one. Now, they do everything possible to interrupt system two, a noisy film strip, walking up to you and offering you warm cookies, moving you to a different room for another pitch, and pressure opportunity is going to disappear if you don't sign now. So, you never have that time to even really think about what your system one got in the mental image, you having fun in Bali, and you never had a chance to think about the fact that actually, if I only get a couple of weeks of vacation a year, one of them I spend with family, it's not likely that I'm going to be even wanting necessarily to come back here for my one vacation a year. System one thinking is uncritical. It just accepts the premise of the question being asked. And it does it even when the question doesn't even make sense. It has a bias towards making sense and then proving whatever it's already decided. It will seek out data that confirms its belief and it will uh, not seek the contraindicated data. So a researcher can lead you into system one thinking certain thoughts for the way they frame questions. Is Sam friendly? Will bring to mind different things about Sam than is Sam unfriendly? What went right today? What do you enjoy about this restaurant? These prime you differently than tell me everything that went wrong today, right? And, um,
seems like there's another thought there that I'm sort of missing. Um, but kind of, uh, but moving on. Um, if you hear a string of words to describe a certain person or place, the first couple words will be weighted heavier than the later words. So if you, your mind starts forming a picture like right away. If I tell you Anna is athletic, honest, funny, capricious, and a wimp, you will feel differently about her than if I say she's a capricious, wimpy, honest, athletic, funny person. And when you're asked to give your opinion about her in a completely unrelated sphere, you're going to be biased by the opinion you've already formed about her. So should Anna be allowed to pre prepare the party food? If you think of her as an athletic, honest, capricious, wimpy person, you might say yes. If you think of her as a capricious, wimpy, honest, athletic person, you will probably say no. Notice the question your mind never asked. Is Anna qualified to prepare the food? If you think of her as a wimp, you don't want to put her in, in charge. If you think of her as wonderful, you do. And you never um, actually ask what are the qualities of a person who should be in charge of looking for the, uh, preparing the food, All right? Is it important she be a good cook? Is the food going to be pre-made? We don't even start asking sort of the rational questions. And, um, Okay, so those are just like, and then the book gets into a lot of, especially for those of you, and I know there's some of you here who love those kind of logic and math and percentages and all of that kind of stuff. There's plenty of those kinds of questions too about the way people jump to conclusions and come to faulty things, which, which I'm not even going to get into here, um, which I really think probably should be taught or there should be some kind of disclaimer when you're about to sign something that go watch this video to kind of begin to understand how you might be being misled by this, uh, the way things are worded here. So I want though to talk about something else which has to do with like a big quality of life issue, a kind of global quality of life issue. So they did research on 154 patients who are undergoing a colonoscopy. Uh, this is kind of really scary, okay? These days they give you a thing that like erases your memory, which somehow still doesn't make it feel like better to me, but that evidently it's kind of a painful thing. And so um, they did 154 patients. The shortest procedure was four minutes and the longest one lasted 69 minutes. And they asked people to report on their state of pain from a one till 10. And then after the colonoscopy, they gave a retrospective on people's overall level of pain that they had experienced during the procedure. Researchers discovered two principles, uh, the duration neglect or the duration of the procedure uh, they found had no effect on the total rating of pain. And the peak end rule, that the global retrospective rating was predicted um, by the average level of pain and the worst moment of the experience at its end. Okay, average together. So for example, if you have patient A and patient B and they both had the first part of their experience exactly the same, they had the same level of pain on the graph in the beginning. And they both had the worst level of pain, which was an eight. But patient B had a longer colonoscopy and experienced significantly more pain overall, just in terms of number, number of minutes that he was at or near the eight. But the last rating was a, patient, was a seven for that patient. And for patient B, the end of it was at a one. So peaked at eight, had less pain overall, it was done faster and ended at a, at a one. Patient B reported a much better experience during his retrospective. After so much pain, wait, I don't know if patient B was, um, had a shorter one. The whole point was they were very similar, except for the one guy at the very end had a lot less pain, okay? And the one who had the less pain, um, only counted the most recent pain, like 
average that in, the highest and the most recent. So if the procedure ended right after a bad experience, it was the bad experience that wasn't remembered. And they call this the peak end rule. Okay, and so I imagine, and imagine this this way with all kinds of different things, relationships you have, friendships, marriages, whatever. Like you have long periods of, of good, but you remember sort of your peak experiences, both good or bad, and then how it ended is averaged in as, and plays a huge role in how you think about it. Stop and think about your own life. The experiencing self is the one that answers the question, does it hurt now? The remembering self is the one that answers the question of how it was on the whole. And memories are what we end up keeping in the end. So all the pain doesn't matter as much as how it ends. It, it doesn't seem intuitive, um, but, it, but it goes into the fact that like in stories, we have the same kind of a thing. There are stories where there's suffering and estrangement. He talks about a, um, an opera that he loves and the whole story, the lovers are separated. But at the very end, in the last 10 minutes of the opera, they get together. Something about us is primed to make a lot out of a happy ending and to give it greater weights than the events in the story. Let me give you an example about another research experience. So this was done by a researcher named Ed Diner and his students. He created a fictitious woman named Jen. And he said, she lived a long and extremely happy life. In some cases, the life was said to have lasted 30 years, in some cases, 60 years. She never had children and she died instantly in an accident. In one person, she was extremely happy throughout her whole life, enjoyed her friends, her work, traveling, <clears throat> hobbies. But in another version, she lived the exact same life, plus an extra five years, during which she had a pleasant, but less happy life. And so participants were asked, taking her life as a whole, how desirable was her life, and how much total happiness or unhappiness would you say she experienced? The results showed uh, duration neglect and peak end neglect. So people said she was substantially less happy, substantially less happy when she got uh, the awesome 30 or 60 years, but had five years tacked on at the end. So even if she lived 30 happy years, they saw her as happier than 60 happy years with five years of less happy tacked on to the end totally makes no sense okay to make so little sense that I started making the story maybe ageism was a factor in why they would say her living 65 years was unhappy rather than dying at 30 after being happy um, but he's calling this the peak end effect and that her life was presented as a prototypical slice of life averaged with the last moment not the sum total of a series of happy moments so we are driven to make decisions by our remembering self and we use our peak experience, uh, but that remembering self is biased because most of our life is not our peak experience, right? And so, um, and I even was talking to Steve about like vacations we take and think like, you know, of the whole thing, what's your best, best part of it? And how much time do you really spend doing those peak experience times? And then how much you value that peak experience because really you're paying all that money for this and this moment because most of it is you know traveling in the car and eating at the Denny's and not so exciting um, now this research into behavioral science which is kind of a new thing behavioral psychology is a new thing and it's important to kind of be aware of because it does have implications uh, for for example for public policy now contrast um, the idea of these behavioral psychologists I've been talking about with um, luminaries at the Chicago School of Economics, people like Milton Freeman, who believe that people are rational agents and that nothing should uh, restrict the exercise of their free will. And that even when a person appears to be making an irrational choice, really there's something they're getting out of that choice so that it is not actually irrational for them. 
And what, and I used to, you know, I kind of heard this in prof uh, personal growth kind of circles, whatever you choose, that shows you what your priorities are, what your priorities really are. And after thinking about it, now I think, no, it just shows you how automatic system one thinking is and how important it is to set up your life so that good decisions are default, right? That it's easier to do the system two thinking. And so, uh, for example, these days, the Obama administration has um, like a task force that is trying to figure out like how to get people to do by default things which will be good for them. So there's like a retirement system and you opted into it. You can opt out of it. The idea here isn't to take away people's free choice. It's just that you make the free choice to opt out if you want to. So you, you, if you default to the lazy thinking, you're more likely to default into something um, that your rational system to self would have analyzed to have been good for you. Um, so there's lots to discuss there. This book really could have even made a series of smaller talks, I think. There's a lot in there. But um, I'm going to end the way I always do. Atheists believe in good because good works in non-mysterious ways. Thank you.